Okay. Okay, we'll call the June 15th meeting of the Economic Development Committee to task at uh, 12 o'clock. That was that one, right? 634. Um, can I have a uh, call to order? Can I have a motion to accept the agenda? Christina and Michelle, all in favor? Carried. Uh, does anybody have uh, disclosure of pecuniary interest? If you do, we'll figure it out somewhere. Then did everybody read the April 20th minutes? Can I have a motion to accept them? Coralie, seconded by. Michelle, all in favor? Carried. So, Justin, where is he? I lost him. Oh, there he is. I'm back. Was he full? Oh. Excellent. Well, I will go ahead through the chair. Uh, so, welcome. Uh, good evening, everyone. So, on behalf of the county, happy to give a, a brief update on uh, what's going on at the Perth County in terms of economic, economic and development and tourism from the last uh, time of the last meeting. So, uh, the first thing I'd like to share is uh, since the last meeting, we have brought on our full complement of uh, summer students this year. We have uh, two tourism summer students and one economic development summer student. Uh, you'll notice that there's a lot of activity going on on our social media these days. We have a couple of real uh, strong social media savvy uh, summer students this year. So they're doing all sorts of uh, really cool and interesting things, including getting some reels going, uh, visiting places across Perth County, uh, really getting uh, kind of close and personal with businesses. Uh, a few weeks ago, you would have seen that it was Tourism Week in Canada. So our, our tourism summer student, uh, Jenna, was primarily the one leading this project where she uh, highlighted a lot of hometown heroes, folks who come from Perth County and gone on to do, uh, you know, big and, and important things in the world and, you know, uh, celebrities in their own right to uh, share why they, why they love Perth County, why they love coming back to Perth County. So uh, again, our social media presence this summer is exceptionally strong with the current summer students we have and the excellent job they're doing. Uh, if you do have any businesses that you'd like to profile, uh, we're always open to, to suggestions and ideas of, of where they can show up next. So uh, please do uh, reach out to, to us and them about uh, you know, some other new and interesting businesses that uh, might benefit from a little bit of social media exposure that we can provide from the county. Uh, so with that, I'm going to share my screen, my screen quickly, if I can, uh, and just draw your attention to the Discover More Adventures, uh, Discover More Adventures program page on our website. I know I talked about this program uh, quite a bit over the last little while, since it is one of our, our marquee tourism programs. Uh, I just wanted to kind of showcase some of the Discover More Adventures that have launched so far, as well as let you know that there are, are quite a few more in the hopper that are being developed currently and will be launching over the next, uh, over the rest of the year. So uh, the most recent to launch was our uh, Aspen's Ojibwe Horse Sanctuary. Uh, we've been at the Stratford Perth Museum, uh, Harry Tenshilling, uh, Argyle Wines, uh, TLC Alpaca, uh, Lynn River Farms, Hoover's Maple Syrup, Huckleberry Highs uh, are just some of the experiences that we've done so far. So again, these are our, uh, really a full wraparound of services from our tourism department, including uh, working with them to develop a professional video, uh, marketing, uh, uh, advertising support, uh, coaching, helping them build that tourism experience onto their business or take an existing tourism experience and uh, kind of level it up. So uh, again, we're still always looking for new businesses. I know uh, we are uh, really interested in getting some West Perth businesses on this program. Uh, so if there are any businesses that you think might be of, uh, might benefit from having that uh, up to $10,000 of marketing support uh, from our, our, our organization and our partners, uh, please do reach out to Ashley Brockbank, our tourism officer, so we can get them on the, on the roster. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Uh, in addition to that, so our, our FarmGate, uh, Discover More Flavor FarmGate program uh, map was was reprinted, relaunched, and updated this year. A number of new businesses, new farm gates from across the county, including West Perth, were added. Uh, so that program continues to grow. Uh, and as we get closer to kind of the harvest season at the end of the year, it's going to be you're going to see a lot more uh, farm gates popping up with that Discover More Flavor program uh, signage, uh, maps, brochures, uh, the whole nine yards. They really do get well supported through this program. Get on our digital map and get on our printed map. Uh, as well, this is a program that's open to any Perth County Farm Gate business. So if there are 
farm gates that aren't on the on currently on our program, uh, please do let them know about the program and reach out to us so we can make sure they're added for uh, next year's printed map at, at any time. Get involved with our our ongoing online promotions. Uh, in addition to that, our, our Discover More uh, tourism brochure uh, was mailed out this uh, earlier this month. So that is, is making the rounds, hitting mailboxes across the county uh, in areas in and in around the county, uh, places that are kind of within a reasonable driving days distance, uh, as well as at on routes and a number of other locations. So uh, that uh, is, again, one of our major programs is getting that brochure into people's hands. Uh, you know, this year again, people are traveling a bit more, but still, still very much, a, you know, uh, some some uh, staycations and local travel. So we're really hoping to leverage that this year again with uh, with our experiences and with the farm gate and as well with just regular programming we run. Uh, so in PC Connect, our community transportation project, the big news out of PC Connect is the launch of our our app. So our digital booking app is now available on Google Play and the App Store. Uh, this is a you know a really fast and convenient way for, for riders to book and pay for their rides uh, from their smartphone, which we know is, is very important. Uh, the app is a bit, the app is called Blaze Transit. is, is the app provider. Uh, you can find that again on Google Play in the App Store, uh, and really is a really convenient way to continue to make PC Connect easier for folks to travel on, as well as provide us with a lot of valuable data in terms of where people are originating the trips, who our frequent riders are, where they're going, and how we can better leverage the service. So uh, really exciting news, a long time uh, in the works to get that up and running, but uh, is now uh, available for, for use. And I guess just in addition to that uh, ongoing uh, PC Connect outreach to employers, we continue to work uh, closely with employers, try to figure out how we can help them use PC Connect to leverage getting their employees to work. We know that the workforce is a major challenge for across the county. So if there's any way that PC Connect can help uh, get employees to work, we do want to continue to support that. Uh, Maggie Martin, our transit coordinator, is doing regular outreach. And one of the things that we're offering to businesses is, is some free passes to their employees to try the service. Uh, we know that once they try it, they'll see how you know convenient it is, how uh, how you know how the how nice buses are and and hopefully use it again. So we want to continue to support that, uh, helping get our employees to the places of work, and helping to uh, make the transit system as, as effective as possible in terms of uh, making slight road adjustments to make sure that those employers are interested. We can try to hit them if possible. Uh, the next thing I'll highlight uh, is an upcoming webinar that we're doing next week on uh, Tuesday, June 21st at 7 p.m. So this is our business uh, transition and session planning webinar. Hopefully you've seen some of these posts on, on LinkedIn. You might have received it in your email, part of our Perth County update, as well as we did mail out some, some uh, individual flyers uh, as well. Uh, this this uh, webinar was, the impetus for this webinar came from our business retention and expansion survey last year. Uh, a large number of businesses who had a transition of some sort of plan, whether it be moving, selling, uh, plans to retire, relocate, uh, what have you. So uh, we, we're offering this webinar uh, free of charge to businesses across the county and beyond. And kind of some of the highlights why, why we think it's important uh, and what you'll learn in this webinar is what succession planning is and where to begin. Uh, under type, understand the common types of business transitions, including family transitions, and find out the five common stages of, of what business transitions are. So one of the things I'm continuing to stress to businesses uh, when they hear about this, they think it's just for folks who are ready to retire, uh, which is absolutely not the case. This is for businesses of any age, stage, industry, uh, having a succession plan is, is critical. And one of the things that I, I learned uh, working with the expert facilitators from succession planning, or succession matching, I should say, uh, who are delivering this presentation is that uh, the best time to develop a succession plan is actually when you start your business. So startups, uh, you know, they can set up in a way, set the corporation up in a way that will meet their kind of end goal, whether it be to sell, to exit, to pass on to uh, family members, what have you. So uh, really we're building this as a webinar for any a business at any age, stage or industry, a succession plan is a critical uh, plan that if you don't have one, uh, you want to get one because it'll it'll save you money, it'll save uncertainty for yourself, for your family, for your business, uh, and can really help you uh, kind of have that that certainty and avoid that risk. In the case that you, when you plan to exit, you've kind of mapped that out ahead of time. So, uh, 
Uh, again, that's uh, next Tuesday, June 21st, 7 to 8 p.m., a, a quick one hour webinar, 45 minutes of, of content and 50 minutes Q&A so that uh, business can get real, real live questions answered. Uh, all the participants will be will be anonymous, so there is no fear of kind of outing yourself if you're planning to sell your business or, or whatnot. Uh, you can participate anonymously, submit the questions, and we'll uh, pose them on, on your behalf. So, uh, again, that's all up on our social media. You can find uh, the Eventbrite, Eventbrite link to register, or if, if you're not having difficulties, please do reach out to me and I can send you a link directly. Uh, I think so. Since the last uh, meeting of this committee, we had approval with our digital service squad, which uh, we've had a couple of iterations of that over the last two years since the pandemic started. This is a, a dedicated staff person whose job it is to help businesses across the county get online, develop online stores, improve their social media, upgrade their website, uh, and apply for grants being offered through Digital Main Street Ontario. So we've offered this program a, a few different times with different staff. Uh, folks on shorter term contracts, but we were uh, grateful that we were able to offer this now for the next uh, almost two years till the end of um, March 2024. Uh, or sorry, yeah, March 2024. Uh, so we do now have, uh, we are currently recruiting for a digital service squad member to deliver that service again for the next two years approximately. Uh, and we do know that uh, although, you know, we're kind of entering a different phase of the pandemic that going digital, becoming more business you know, digital savvy is not uh, not just a trend that's going to end kind of when things uh, hopefully do get back to normal, that businesses will want to continue to, you know, tap new markets, be able to sell things online, be able to communicate with their customers in the new way that customers are used to receiving information now that they've, uh, you know, done so for the last few years. So this will really help us continue to help our businesses level up digitally over the next two years. So I'm really excited that we we're able to successfully apply for that grant and be able to have this staff person uh, recruited and onboarded hopefully soon and, and out in the community uh, can continue to promote uh, going digital. Uh, and then just finally, our, uh, our business directory update. This is kind of an ongoing project we work on, uh, kind of going back to our business retention expansion survey uh, and especially throughout the pandemic businesses, you know, getting new websites, becoming, uh, you know, changing email addresses, what have you. Uh, we want to make sure that we have accurate information about our you know, business phone numbers, email address and addresses so we can communicate with them in all those ways, whether it be uh, telephone surveys, sending emails about webinars or, or programs we're offering, and even mailing addresses. Once in a while, we do like to kind of go a bit old school and make sure that we're not missing those businesses that aren't online and that they, they get that information as well. They're not being excluded because they're not, uh, they're not online. So... Uh, we are currently putting a push to get businesses online, so you may or may not receive a, uh, a package in the mail, uh, or you would have received a package in the mail, and if not, we probably don't have your accurate mailing address, so we're, uh, we're trying to reach out to those folks in different ways, just to make sure that we, again, do have uh, that full uh, breadth of information on how to get a hold of our business community so we can uh, continue to offer program services and uh, be able to communicate with them effectively. So. I think that's really the update I wanted to give for this evening and would welcome uh, any questions from the committee. Any questions for Justin? Oh, off the hook, kid. Thank you. All right. And then, so next we have, oh, Jeff, it'll be two hours, so. <laughs> oh, I laughed out loud too, Doug. Thank you for all of your support, uh, Doug. That was kind of you. I'll be really quick tonight. Thanks. Um, so I have I have a few slides. Two things I'm going to cover. I'm going to provide a really brief municipal update and take a quick uh, few questions on that. And then I'll move into um, the plan for the fall economic development event. And uh, so I'll just cover them in two separate pieces. Um, on the municipal updates, I just want to advise that you know we continue to work on Heron Business Park. A park. I had a um, very good meeting today with uh, BM Ross, and we um, we've made really good progress on the servicing model on um, on the 
costing for the servicing model and uh, we are nailing, trying to nail down a date for a meeting with that neighbor to the east of us, Cargill Limited, that we want to do a joint uh, venture on a stormwater management pond with. And we now have all the information we need to support that meeting and we have to find out whether they're going to participate or not and take it from there. And I will mention that uh, that property that's shown in yellow, and this is actually the map that was in the Economic Development Newsletter, is the property that Fred Gronestage Construction purchased from West Perth last year. It's just a little over six acres and we're working on the site plan for them. I believe they hope to be uh, under construction here in the next couple of months. And uh, that'll be a nice addition to the business park next to Hogs Flat. Uh, on the development project side, um, I just took a quick look at the map that we had in our economic development newsletter that we issued and uh, thought I was thinking about new projects and there's even some new ones to put on here, but I listed this group and just want to provide you with a quick project update. The Avco, Avco Apartment Project, which is apartments targeted at seniors on St. David Street. Um, the site plan has now been approved and uh, we are... Uh, We'll expect that construction should start there any time. I believe the building permits also, uh, if not approved, very close to being approved. Um, Wimpole Street North, which is uh, Wimpole Street North of Huron, at the west end of town, if you've been out that way, you will notice that the, um, the road, that Wimpole Street connection going from Huron to Park Lane is now uh, built by the developer. And actually they've got two fourplexes uh, one fourplex or two? I can't recall whether it's one or two. One, Doug says one. Uh, fourplex built, and that was their model. And uh, we anticipate that they'll be getting going on additional site plans to do the rest of them. But it's nice to see that project underway. And that road link is a great uh, road link to have. Um, Anderson Lane, which is a little north of that, um, on land that's on the uh, uh, back of the Mitchell Nursing Home on the Wimpole Street frontage of the Mitchell, so the backside of where the Mitchell Nursing Home would be. That project's in the final stages of approval. Uh, there's a number of semi-detached uh, um, structures in that one as well. It's gone to the county, and I think that there's just expecting a report back with draft, draft approval conditions. It's done. So um, we should see a subdivision agreement and dirt moving um, for building homes uh, and, and the extra uh, road very soon. Um, Nelson, Nelson Street South, which is the piece of Nelson Street between, um, between Clayton and Frank Street. Uh, we have uh, Van Pelt uh, looking at doing the final phase of their development, single family lots fronting on the new newly constructed Nelson Street. They're advancing along with their project and they have draft plan approval. We're in the very final stages of getting their uh, subdivision agreement signed and they're very anxious to start road construction. And I expect we'll see them start that project within the next week or two. And I believe that's 11 single family or 12 in the neighborhood of 11 or 12 single family lots. Um, Mitchell Woods um, is the development at the end of Clayton Street the west end of Clayton or the west end of Kenton Street, they they connect that development is fully registered and uh, we should expect to see building permits issued there in the very near future. You that, that road connection has been in for some time. We've got a few servicing quirks that we've got to work through with that one, but they would be ready to go ahead uh, with building permits. If you've been out to the west end, you'll also notice that virtual truck and trailer equipment, which is on the south side of Highway 8 and the Highway Commercial uh, area of town um, near the Home Street, which is the road to the landfill. That project is underway and that's a, an excellent Highway Commercial development for West Perth. And Thames Avenue, um, which is part of the Riverside development, uh, construction is imminent there as well. So Thames Avenue currently ends at um, Francis Street and it will actually it comes in a little bit and then it'll go through to Henry Street and it'll be newly built coming through to Henry Street. We've got uh, permits in for 20 units uh, in there which is two fiveplexes and two fourplexes or sorry 18 units two fiveplexes two fourplexes. Um, you should expect that um, uh, I think the building permits are all ready to go. We're just waiting for the uh, registered um, registration at the registry office to be able to provide PIN numbers and we can issue those building permits and see construction start there. And I know the developers 
of that project are ready to go and they're going to add a nice variety of housing to our community. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll just put the map up and I'm not going to go through and highlight all those areas. You'll recall this from our, this is the page from our economic development newsletter. Um, and uh, we can come back if there's any questions about these. I do have the map when we get the questions. And then uh, a couple of uh, other quick updates from the municipality, recreation updates, the summer camps uh, staff are hired. We had good luck with hiring this year. We're quite pleased with the recruits. Uh, registration has been strong. We can have up to 26 children per day with the staff complement that we've got hired. Almost all days are fully booked uh, with a wait list. And, and I think we have almost as many YMCA camp spaces in Mitchell as there are in Stratford. So um, it's hard. And I, I really think the problem with Stratford has been uh, recruiting staff. We've been really lucky to be able to recruit staff, but um, that's one of the things that you can't run programs if you don't have camp leaders. And uh, uh, it's something to keep in mind as we go forward. Um, our pool and splash pad are open. Um, we've had a number of projects with the pool capital projects and and when I say that it's been challenging, that's a tremendous understatement. We've got quite a few things going on with the pool. Darcy's team has done a great job of getting it up and running. And every time we get one thing fixed, something else breaks. Uh, some of this is related to contract administration, which are simply contractor repairs that have to be made and they take time. Um, and there's been a couple of unanticipated expenditures, but not too bad, it just, they take time. So we're doing well with that in a day like today, uh, people will be very glad to have the pool and splash pad. They're important parts of our cooling plan for the community. And the uh, if you've been around by the uh, frontage of the arena at 185 uh, Wellington Street, you will have noticed across the road from the front entrance of the arena is the uh, Veterans Park uh, area. And that parkette is currently being installed. So there'll be an accessible path with a number of low maintenance gardens. And uh, there will be community garden boxes installed in that park as well and so that'll be um more of um more of an active use park at it's been a very sort of passive park in the past um so we're just adding additional use to it it's right next to where we developed the tennis courts or pickleball courts which would have been going really well and uh, we are leaving the, the the stone monument there and working the gardens around it so if you get a chance to go by that project's being installed by one of our local landscape companies this week the Kedison Park Pavilion and Accessible Walkway project, I reported at the last meeting, the project was tendered and came in over budget. We've rescoped the project, which was really reducing the size of the footprint. And we also removed some of the storage on the second store, story of the building to bring the cost down. It, that, building, that project came in um, quite a bit over budget and it's really a reflection of escalated costs from 2019 to 2022. The revised drawings are just in the final stages. We have everything except for mechanical uh, and a little bit of electrical to update. When we get those updated drawings with the new footprint size and with the single story design, um, we will ask the five bidders on the original tender process to rebid. Uh, we've secured an ICIP grant, if, uh, just as a reminder, and that ICIP grant was for one 66% uh, of 1.25 billion. So this is a great community project with a lot of federal and provincial money flowing into West Perth. We certainly want to proceed with this project. We've got the timeline extended. Um, we've got the fundraising package together. We'll need to modify it a little bit and we've kind of parked fundraising a little bit while we get the rescope done. And you can expect that fundraising will start in earnest when we um, have a project uh, and we start digging, that's when the fundraising will really get going. So the plan, uh, the updated plan for schedule is that we would like to uh, get the tender um, issued and the project contract signed before uh, the end of August so that we can have a start date for construction in the fall and have a spring 2023 completion, probably late spring 2023. So that project's on its way. And then I think the final one I'm going to mention is the uh, municipal office. We're on schedule for a midsummer completion. This is a shot from about four o'clock this afternoon. It's a lazy shot because I took it from the second story of the, the current building. And it's, so it's the back and not the front, but it gives you a sense of what the, the lighting's going to look like that will be on the front and the trim colors. And uh, the front has been nicely wrapped up as well. And I just didn't get a chance to run around there and get a picture today. And um, just out of the shot you, is the storm 
sewer pipes and the uh, manholes. Um, we are just about ready to get the civils done. And the hope is that we will be in in the uh, first week of August with um, uh, the first meeting in there for council, hopefully August 22nd, or as late as September the 6th. And I'm going to speak more about the municipal office in a couple of minutes when I give an update on the, the fall event, but I think I'll pause there, uh, unshare my screen and see if there's any questions about that part of the update. Any questions for Jeff? Christina? Yeah, I have a question about the uh, Ketterson Park stuff. Um, I can't remember exactly how much over budget the tender stuff was or how the process works exactly, but um, is it at all possible to kind of have two options where we have both of them costed, but as fundraising goes, you could say theoretically, if we make over X amount, we can add some storage back to the building, yeah. kind of like how you do with... Um, Oh, what's it called? When they do those fundraising campaigns online and they have stretch goals? I could go for oh, it. Yeah. yeah, so good question. The answer is uh, it came in at $1.25 million budget and it came in at $1.85 million, which is um, one third over budget. Uh, we did that design and preliminary budget estimate in 2019 and that's your price escalation for everything from engineering to materials. So it's substantially over. Um, we've made a commitment to redraw for a smaller footprint. We haven't given up any of the community storage or any of the um, community amenities. We're keeping the roof high enough to do basketball. It's not regulation basketball, but it's kind of good for free play bas basketball. Um, so we're not giving up any of those amenities, which was important to get the approval of the federal government for the rescoping. But um, there really isn't a middle ground between the 1.85 and the 1.25 estimate. It's gonna probably, I, I think we'll be happy if we can get it in at 1.25 um, because the prices are still continuing to go up. So great question, we've thought about it. And uh, I think we're going to have to find another plan for more storage for the municipality. But we've got the community storage in there. Everybody else's pictures are off, so I can't see. There's Coralie. Yeah. Uh, I've got Michelle. I Coralie's got a question. question. Okay. Um, just with the Birch Hill, so is there anything besides the McDonald's going in there? Do we know? Oh, two things. So oh. McDonald's is the east end, and that's where Birch Hill used to be. And that, oh, okay. I, this yeah, is the other. Okay. The fast food, and I was actually mentioning the Birch Hill the, the other. other end, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, McDonald's. Um, at the uh, East End, they've announced, and I know that they're doing job fairs, they're talking about quite a high number of employees. And I think the preliminary uh, results haven't been overwhelming, but I think they'll keep at it. So, and I don't believe there's anything, I think what's there now will be a gas bar and a McDonald's, yeah. but okay. Uh, yeah. Okay, and Michelle had a question too. Um, I did, I, I just, Michelle. oh, well, I'm here. Go ahead, there you are. He's there. So you mentioned up, um, so in the old Ritz or the uh, old Mitchell nursing home, you mentioned that there's going to be a few um, semis up there. So having just gone through this back behind us where we had to have smaller lots and there was a fourplex and all of that, does that not apply to all the new places? Well, there's the new there's 21, or... 21 semis going up behind the nursing home. And 42 have... units. Yeah. Okay. Like and they're so all they... semis. And then their lots are the same, so they will have smaller lots and they have to be affordable housing. And because that's quite a large parcel, right? That's a five acre parcel of land. So I just was curious how, how that works. Yep. Uh, I could take a crack at it. So the, uh, I believe it's 21 lots, 42 units. Uh, they had to, the, the official plan policy required them to look at um, 10, uh, eight, six or eight of the 42, they were looking at affordability uh, factors and they've, they've got an alternative design to allow a, um, an in-unit uh, rentable apartment as an affordability function. So that's what they've incorporated into that project. And uh, that's what County Council considered in ensuring that they met the affordability clause of the official plan. All right, anybody else? Continue on, Jeff. Great, thanks. Um, I'll go back and share my screen again, and I'm just going to move on to cover um, 
share. Great. Great. I want to just talk about the economic development fall meeting, uh, our fall event. So there was agreement at the last meeting that uh, we would plan for a wine and cheese style event in the new municipal office for the fall. And so the, the, the space allocation that we would use for that is we would have the new council chambers and on the one side of the hall, the new community room on the other side of the hall. And there's, there's a nice lobby that you can work with in between. We would set up most of the event in the council chambers. We would have the community room for some overflow and we would anticipate that there'll be some kind of, um, uh, you know, people moving around, having a look and whether we would uh, organize uh, group tours or something like that. It'll really depend on the status of how moved in we are because they're, we're cutting this a little bit close. So that part will leave maybe as an, a last minute option to decide about tours. The target audience for the event um, is like our target audience for our bre breakfasts when we used to do them is the business industry and agriculture community. Um, we're thinking a mixer style. So I think everyone on this call would have been at our last business breakfast we had before we experienced COVID where we had stand up tables, we had uh, hors d'oeuvres and um, uh, hors d'oeuvres and we had, um, we had a limited formal agenda and a few displays. We had some service providers that the county set up. We had the opportunity for people to pick up newsletters and things like that. And we, and we really kept it very informal. Um, and I think there was, you know, only a couple of quick uh, presentations or just updates or welcomes. And I think we would uh, keep it to that. Um, the key dates to mention for this event are that uh, the, the target for the new office occupancy by staff is somewhere in the August 4th to 10th range. We might be earlier, we might be a little late, but it's gonna be in that ballpark. Um, the first council meeting in there we hope is August 22nd, or we could push it back to September 6th and we'll be making a decision about that at the beginning of July, what our occupancy date is and then working backwards from there. And our, our time schedule for the Economic Development Committee event would be September 21st. And, and the one date I haven't put on this list of dates is the election, which is October 24th. And, and I think it would be very, um, I think we, I really like, and we recommend it the September 21st date um, to use it for about, for a number of reasons. Number one, I think that uh, the closer we are to summer, the less likely it is to be going into some next wave of COVID. And while I'm obviously very hopeful, and I think the science would tell us that things should get better, um, we're not certain. And so um, I think if we leave it into November or December, you run the risk that you're not going to be able to run the event because there'll be some restrictions. So I think staying closer to summer is a good idea. I think you can't go any closer because of the building schedule. And I don't think we'd want to go any later because of the election. And uh, I think, you know, as a staff person, I squirm a little bit um, having events at this time of year in election year, because you don't want to turn them into um, election kind of events, but uh, this is a, this is part of our regular business and we'd want to see it go on, but I think it's nice that it's a little ways away from the actual election day. So those are the um, timing considerations. And then as far as event format goes, um, I'm proposing, and this is, I absolutely am interested in getting feedback and then I'll do further refinements and, and we'll get it ready and maybe we'll have a quick organizing meeting uh, the last week before, just to make sure that we've got it all together, not a formal committee meeting, but perhaps a working meeting of the organizing uh, to just make final adjustments where we call and invite you in and have you come and, and we do a quick run through. Um, so I'm proposing that we run the event from 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Some businesses don't close until five or even six. So uh, I think we keep it going till seven. We're really not trying to feed people dinner, but we're gonna give them enough um, uh, hors d'oeuvres and, and uh, snacks that they don't get hangry. And um, I'm proposing uh, charcuterie boards, um, uh, hors d'oeuvres, uh, fruit. I've talked to Mary Beth who did our last um, event when we did it as a breakfast and we did this kind of breakfast style hors d'oeuvres. 
um, and she's got lots of great ideas of things that we can provide that are very functional and she's available on the 21st and is holding the date for us. Um, we would use our facilities liquor license, which we can move around to our various facilities. We'll just have to make sure we get this new one on. Uh, and I have a few questions for feedback, which I think uh, we can take as part of the questions is, you know, if we're gonna do wine, do we look for a sponsor? Um, obviously we have someone in town, but do we, do we find, you know, do we invite um, some sponsorship of this? I, I would think the way we would do it is if we had a sponsor, we'd provide a free ticket to each guest and then sell additional tickets if anybody wanted additional ticket, or we can avoid all of that and simply sell our tickets. So if you want a glass of wine, you pay for a glass of wine. We're going to have a bartender. We're going to have a liquor license. And that perhaps is the simplest way to do it. And we could have, we could have, you know, if you want a glass of wine or if you want a beer, you have a glass of wine or you have a beer and you pay for it. So that's the options. Um, I'm kind of leaning, I would recommend that we consider that just you buy for, pay for what you get. I'm not a big fan of the municipality providing liquor to um, the public or staff and, and, or I should say wines, not liquor, but alcoholic beverages. Uh, I think it keeps it a little cleaner, but if we wanted us to pursue a sponsor, we could do it. <laughs> and we do have, we do have a beer company producing beer here, and we do have uh, wine and if even if we sell, we could probably go to them and talk to them. So I'm prepared to pursue whatever the committee would like me to pursue, and I'd like your input. And then finally, um, at the last economic development committee breakfast, what we did is the committee members provided assistance with welcoming guests, and we we took down some basic information to make sure our mailing lists and things were updated. And then we had Ask Me T-shirts where it said, you know, if you have a question, ask me. Um, we put, we gave bright t-shirts to committee members and we had you, the committee members work the room, make sure that people are networking and make sure if they have any questions or they want to meet somebody that um, they're there to facilitate that. So um, with that, I would, and Doug, I'm going to stop my share and I'm just going to show you how to put the gallery on your screen so that you've got everybody. Can you see everyone in your oh, screen? Yeah, okay. I can see everybody. Good. All right. Any questions? Anyone's thoughts? Start throwing things out there. Shell? I, I like the idea if you want a, a drink, then you get a drink. You pay for your own drink. Um, so not being a drinker, and I walk in and I always get a ticket, and then I'm running around trying to find somebody to get my ticket to. So I think, yeah, I know. So I think from the standpoint of the ease and to, that if someone wants a a drink that, or a glass. And I would say I would have the beer guy and the wine there. I think that's very important that we support our local businesses. Um, so I would give them an opportunity to be there. I think that's a great idea. Or Lee, you're probably at the beer guy every day. So what do you think? Oh, my on? Yeah, yeah, you're on. Uh, no. Is Carly um, on? Yeah, yeah I am. Yeah, I think that makes, I agree completely with what Michelle said. Yeah, yeah. I think it should be pay pay as you go. And yeah, let's definitely support the local people. Okay. Christina, actually our wine people really can't sell wine, right? Like they could make wine for other people, but they're like, if you talk wine it up, yeah. they're not allowed to actually sell wine. You have the, like Michelle would have to go in and make it. It's different. But Christina, oh, what are you sad? You wine there all the time. Um, so we'll sell beer and wine. Yeah, I, I think uh, what everyone else sounds great. Um, we might not have someone immediately within town who does the wine thing, but there might be a winemaker we could tap for it regardless. The, the, the town, the, uh, uh, Darcy probably has certain wines over there, does he, Jeff? Um, yeah, and I, and I think, you know, we could maybe, maybe the municipality could make the wine and do custom labels. And, you know, then I wonder if we can sell it. So we'll have to look into the legality yeah. of that. And um, and so it's just something I'll certainly look into it because if it's a if if it's a little bit of a if it works out that you can't have homemade wine from a winemaker and we do have wine it up. Um, um, if we can't do that and sell it to recover our cost, I'll I'll 
come up with some different proposal and I'll bring it back to you. And maybe Michelle's got an idea. Michelle? So you can, um, so for example, with a private function, if you bring in your own wine for a wedding, uh, as long as you pay a corking fee to the liquor license bureau, which a long time ago was $9.75 a bottle, uh, then you can sell or give the wine away. So he okay. could make the wine. Uh, you just have to, in your license, you have to pay a corking fee, which gives you permission to sell or give it away. At least you used to. I don't know if they've changed that law, but that was the law. Your command of the legislation is impressive for someone who doesn't drink. So thank you, Michelle. Oh. I used to drink. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So we'll certainly look into that. That's a great piece of advice. And I suspect that corking fee is still in place. So perhaps that's the way we do it. And then the combination of, I love the idea of if Donnelly would pr provide beer, and I'm certain they would, um, uh, again, it'd be fairly inexpensive per drink and we just work out the price. We don't have to make money from keep the it, event. Keep it low. So. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and we have the Knights of Columbus do the bar for us when we do that. They have the smart serve, and we always have to build in our cost to cover them. So, what other questions did you have on your sheet? Was that it? The charcuterie board, which is food, cheese. Yeah. Wow. Um, any any comments on the food? Uh, I think we keep it very light. We don't want to have nothing. Um, I just uh, did. We do aprons last time instead of t-shirts. Oh, you're right, Meredith. I suggested. Uh, t-shirts and Meredith came up with aprons so that's a great one for Justin to take back to Meredith if we uh, if she thinks aprons or t-shirts what did you think aprons or t-shirts Christina the great thing about aprons is that they're fully sizable and you can reuse them for other events because I don't remember coming home with a t-shirt or anything last time I, I think either. it got saved so we might want to look into that we, we should maybe look around <laughs> In the basement, there's probably a box with eight aprons in that says, ask me. Do you know that when we move out of this building, we're going to find a lot of things that I haven't been able to find. It's going to be, I'll need volunteers to help us move. Anyone who would like to volunteer. So, okay, we'll look for aprons. Jeff, I can say that if you want to get rid of your Y2K uh, mugs from Fullerton, you just have to like offer them to random children because mine fight over ours because it has gold and so it's like oh, shiny. Good. We've got a program where we give them away at the office if you just show up and ask for a couple. So, <laughs> okay, for gold. Is okay. it possible? Is it possible to maybe um, do something like because our our food bank is really struggling right now? Is it possible to do a donation at the door towards the food bank or um, the proceeds from the sale of the liquor would go towards gift cards for the food bank? Can we incorporate maybe something like that that's going to benefit more than just the people showing up? Is that a feasible thing? Um, I see no reason why not. And I think identifying a local cause where we would put any profit or any donations we receive is a wonderful idea and and you'll remember michelle we've had discussions in the past about you know do we give out the centerpieces and do we i think we've kind of moved away from spending money on that and i would rather see the money go to the food bank and unless there's another cause i'm quite prepared to set it up that we have the plan for donations to the food bank is there consensus work on that? that? Shake ahead. Yeah. Three shakes. Okay, for us. Good. All right. All right. So any profit uh, from the bar or any proceeds that we receive will go to the food bank. Okay. Great. Um, any other feedback? Justin Diaz. Yeah, just one minor, minor thing. I guess... Uh, if we want to like add an incentive for people to come, we usually, we can all, always provide like a Perth County uh, gift basket for everybody shows up gets the yeah. drop ticket to go in and win a, a gift basket of Perth County goodies. So we're we're always willing to provide one of those if that'll provide an additional incentive to get folks out. I think that's a great idea to do. Um, some Perth County swag is always nice. And then if everyone agrees, we'll take these as the marching orders. We will have uh, probably an email update 
to confirm the date around uh, the end of August, um, because that's when we'll want to start to do our social media um, promotion and get it out to our email list. Um, so we'll have to confirm that it's a go uh, um, mid-August probably. And by that time, we'll know where we're at with the construction schedule. And if that ends up being the case and we can go, then probably about the week before, I'll, I'll, uh, we'll send an email and invite anyone that's from the committee that's able to attend to come to like a little working meeting. We'll do a quick walkthrough of what we're going to do and identify any last tasks. And then um, we'll have a bit of setup on the day of for anyone that can come early. So are we sending, uh, sorry, just remind me again, are we sending letters to everyone as opposed to just emails? There's a lot of the older email, contingency yeah. that don't do emails uh, or do yeah. social media and are we putting something in the paper or how are we doing this? Yeah, so um, last, what we've done and I think we've kind of gone back and forth, Michelle, so it's a great question. Um, we tried doing it just by email one year and I think we decided the next year, no, we have to send a send letter the to the mailing list as out of date as it might be, or as good as it might be, the mail works better. So I would think we would use our mailing list to run a set of uh, 340 labels and send them out. And we will use the, uh, we will use the newspaper to advertise. Um, you know, we realize, I realize, I think we all realize that we may have people who show up that aren't agriculture, business, or industry, and we're not gonna be uh, policing that, it's just the reality. You might have a few people pop in or interested, that's fine. And uh, we will use social media as uh, as the third element of that. Process. Sign, sign, digital sign. Yeah, we could use the digital sign, good call. So mail. Uh, so mail, email, social media, digital sign, and newspaper. Coralie is a question. Just well, a comment. I think last time we made contact with the Federation of Agriculture yeah. um, as well. I'm not sure how much uptake there was, but it can't hurt to do that. Yeah, and Coralie, did they have an email list that they yeah, could pass to? I think okay. they do. Yeah, so, yeah um, I know they do. Yeah, I'll, so, I can get you some contacts for that. Yeah. OFA email blast, good. Yep. And we've got the BIA email blast, and we have the list that we've generated from our past breakfast. That comes, it's, it lines up with the directory, Justin. Yeah, so, okay, good. Other questions, suggestions? You got all your information you need. You uh, think? I have, I have lots. It's very helpful, okay. and I think we just work away at it. So thank you, everyone. Okay. Um, so we have our upcoming meeting schedule, which is obviously September twenty-first, and then uh, November sixteenth. Other business. Christina. No. Nope. Or Lee. No. Nope. Michelle. Justin. Doug. Um. So if there's nothing else to do, does that bring an end? If I can just do it, I'll just jump in quick. Oh, um, that's Daniel. Thanks. Um, November 16th, with that kind of being the next meeting, just put your minds to budget and programs for next year. So um, we'll come to that meeting to try and run the committee through the uh, through the budget. That's all. Yeah. Just wanted to give the committee notice on that. Yeah, because this committee will, then November 16th will be the last meeting of this committee because there'll be a new council and there'll be new committee appointments. Thanks, Dan, for reminding me to say that. I forgot. Thanks for having your little gaffer in the background there talking. <laughs> they, they just got home from blast ball. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Is that an in-person meeting or is that a Zoom meeting? November, uh, our November meeting yeah, you know, we'll have to make a call. I think we can probably be in person uh, again, unless we're going backwards. But in November, we'll have the new facility to use yeah. the meeting rooms with the good air handling. Uh, we, we could actually have the amount of people on this call in this because you can't see this, but they pulled the horseshoe apart in this room and put tables in between because we got 11 counselors in here the other night, all six feet apart. So, but in the new building over there, we could have our six or eight committee members yeah. and each one have a hundred square feet basically in the corner. So, 
but we'll know that on the 21st of he's September, kind of. Yeah, he's yeah. exaggerating. Yes, things always look bigger from up here. Um, anything else then? If not, call the meeting adjourned at uh, 725. We'll take a motion for that. Michelle and then Gore Lee, because I can't see. Where did uh, Christina go? In favor? Good. All right. Thanks very much. Um, see you on the street.